kind of fun. This time on Finnegan's Garage, I've got Todd and Will from Power Driven Diesel, and they are here because we are taking the 454 out of the ramp truck. And in its place, we are putting a fire-breathing 650 horsepower Cummins 12 valve out of that military truck under the hood of this thing, and it's gonna fit perfectly. We're not gonna have to cut anything. Right? Right. Like a glove. Right? Big block to leak. Big block to leak. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna get better mileage. We're gonna go faster. If I get back to the drag strip, we will eclipse the 19 second quarter mile time that this truck originally ran. And in general, we're just going to be cooler. That's, that, all. that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So stay tuned. So here's what's going on. This is a 1997 Dodge Ram 2500 diesel pickup. It's been converted by the Ent Whistle Company for military duty. They cut the back of the frame off, rolled the axle forward, changed the gears. This is basically made for tugging around really heavy loads, which is probably why it's got a diesel in it. So we're going to disassemble the entire front end of the truck. All the sheet metal, the core support, the accessories, the batteries, it's all coming out, all in the name of getting that 5.9 liter diesel engine out so that we can hot rod it and stick it in my ramp truck. On these, you know, second gen trucks, the wiring is pretty simple. We have one main lead that feeds everything. It just works its way from the driver's side, around the front, and it ends at your alternator. So I've been told that you can run this engine with just one wire. So when people say that, what are they talking about? There's a, there's a shutdown soy right here. Okay. This pulls up and allows fuel. You can run it with a zip tie. Oh, as long as that up, that's up, fuel you, will go. If you could start this like a manual truck, if you pull it up and run it down a hill and pop the clutch, no electric is needed at all. Wow. It's just compression and fuel. And uh huh. Out. And so there's a lever. This is actually, to turn it off, this lever pushes this down the pump and it cuts off fuel. So to turn it off, you cut fuel, not spark. Okay. No computer. I like it. Yep. So we've got the front end off, the radiator's gone, intercooler's out, bumper's off. We're pretty close to pull this thing out. We just got to disconnect the transmission from the engine right now. We're going to drain the transmission, loosen the torque converter bolts and the bell housing bolts, and then we're going to pull this thing out. Oh, we're getting close now. Hoist is coming out. Go ahead. The rocker stand is up in here. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Beautiful. Go up. It is out. Tech tip: remove two valve covers, gives you a little more clearance to come out. Here's another tech tip for all you haters out there that think I shouldn't put this in a Chevy. Let's be real. This never fit in a Dodge anyway. We basically had to bend the cow up two inches and take two rocker covers off to get this out. Okay, so we're going to pull this trans out, which functions perfectly, and we're going to give it to these guys as a core for the trans that we are putting in. And this thing can go outside, and hopefully somebody buys it and gets it out of my life, because mm -hmm. we all know second-gen Dodge is... Probably the most beautiful trucker for me. <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. So I'm naturally curious about what any engine weighs, because weight is a big factor in terms of performance, you know? It's awesome if you have an engine that makes a thousand horsepower, but if that engine weighs 2,000 pounds, who cares? So, we're gonna weigh this. Cause I've heard these can weigh as much as 1,300 pounds, 1,100 pounds, 1,000 pounds. We're gonna find out for sure. Yep. No oil, coolant strained out. Pump is on. No oil, no coolant. What's it gonna weigh? That's a good question. 1,285. 1,310. One pound. <laughs> Price is right, rules. Up we go. I bet you were high. high. Oh, 800, 900. Oh, That's look how it. high we are. Wow. wow. Oh. Way lighter than I thought it was going to be. This engine rocks. That's a lot of <laughs> cast iron. So it's 943 plus probably about 15 pounds of chain. So let's go 930 pounds. That is. Awesome. Yeah. Well, that's it for day one of the ramp truck Cummins engine swap. 
we didn't get as far as we wanted, frankly, because this thing was shoehorned into that RAM, but also because the delivery guy boned us. We were expecting a pallet full of parts, including new turbos, a transmission, all kinds of swap stuff we needed. That didn't arrive, so we're gonna knock off here tonight, and tomorrow we will push this pile out in my driveway. Hopefully somebody takes it and I never see it again. Welcome back, it's day two. We didn't get a lot done yesterday, but we did get the 12 valve out of the RAM, proving this engine really doesn't belong in this truck. Because any truck, you have to pry the cowl up so high that the windshield nearly cracks just to remove the engine. These don't belong together, which is why that's going in the ramp truck. Hopefully today, we're gonna push the ramp truck in here, I think with one of my other trucks, because pushing it by hand is not really an option. The thing weighs like 8,000 pounds. And with any luck, by the time we do that, the UPS guy will bring the parts that he should have delivered last week. And uh, then the fun begins. Then we start bolting on speed parts and talking to Todd about how much this thing will actually produce at the tires on my truck. Well, we've robbed the inner cooler, the radiator, the engine, the starter. Uh, you just took out the gas pedal uh, cable and linkage. Is there anything else about this thing we should grab before we push it outside and let some second gen lever take this truck? We should grab this uh, shutdown solenoid pigtail off of here, this weather pack connector, and uh, these two relays that run it. Okay, uh, what, what's the shutdown solenoid again? So this shutdown solenoid, you see it has these big black, red, and white wire. Basically, when the engine is shut off, there's a spring that keeps this down. When you energize the hold solenoid, the small one, once this is up, if you let go, it would stay up. It's a little hold magnet. There's also a big pull magnet that's the 70 amp, and it actually will pull up against that spring. Once that's up, the truck's running. When you kill the voltage, the spring in there drops it down. That shuts off the fuel. The truck shuts off. Okay. <laughs> you can do it! Oh, nice long! <laughs> It's official. You've moved out of the, oh my God, I hope these aren't just roadkill fans that want to hang out at my house to <laughs> people that actually have speed parts because <laughs> they finally arrived. Right. This was supposed to be here last Thursday. Today's Tuesday. 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 Yeah, so up until today I was like, I don't know about this power driven diesel thing. Maybe they just created an entire website just so they could hang out here. <laughs> it is kind of a nice garage. It is. I'm just kidding. Let's see what's inside. Wow, this is full. Oh, yeah, the manifold's made it sweet. The exhaust manifold. Three piece? His three pieces. Yeah, is this man. pressed together? Yep. So look at how little the port is. That's T3. So cute. T3. Yeah. Oh, and these are worth at least 20 or 30 torques right here. That's right. That was, that's the real fast part. Yeah, that's that's 20 torques. I believe this one's 30 um, because of you know the font and the color. Now, the industry new terminology is horse torques. Horse so that's torques? worth how many horse torques and how many whistle pounds. Oh, I want to put this into perspective for you all at home, especially the guys that are saying you're an idiot for taking the 454 out. We're not going inside of this engine at all. We're not opening up ring gaps. We're not changing connecting rods, pistons, cylinder head, camshaft, nothing. All externals. And this engine used to make 180 horsepower. At the flywheel. At the flywheel. What are we going to make now with the flywheel? We think you'll, at the flywheel, I think it's going to be over 700. Right. Bolt-ons. <laughs> I love diesels. <laughs> and yeah, it'll be noisy and, uh, and probably not as smooth as a V8, but I won't care when I'm climbing a mountain with my Bel Air on the back of the ramp truck at 70 or 80 miles an hour. Allegedly. Okay, right there. After a day and a half of doing nothing but disassemble and staining my floor, it is time for the fun part. We are going to take all of these speed parts, bolt them onto the outside of this old Cummins engine, stab it in that ramp truck, and go do burnouts. Changing the valve springs, right? Yep. Push rods. Yeah. So this is the one that's used for 12 hours. If you ever rebuild a motor, pretty much you're always going to upgrade your tappets. The tappets in the 12 valve have a very small mushroom. And so uh, typically when we do an aftermarket cam, we're going to do a much larger lifter. Okay. And those have a different um, receiver, you know, hole, ball, and, ball cup. and cup. 
And so this is a 12 valve cup, so it'll fit in a stock 12 valve lifter. But if you were to do a, a lifter upgrade, this would be a much larger, which spreads the force over a bigger area, so it's stronger. But this is what works for a 12 valve okay. tap it. We get calls about this all the time, how to change valve springs, and they're worried about dropping valves in the head. So what a lot of guys will tell you to do, you pull injector out, so you put it like down on the bore. I'm using TIG rod because yeah. it's flexible, won't hurt anything. That makes it not a pain in the ass. We just wait until this comes all the way up, obviously. It looks like up. we're out, up and over. And the valve can't fall down when you take the spring off. Mm -hmm. And do you have like an on-head valve spring removal tool? We sure do. So when you're like hearing about you know 12 valve injectors in here, I got a set of five by 12s, five by 14s, five by 20s. Five is the number of holes. Mm -hmm. The next one is the size in thousands. You know, some common rules are six hole or seven hole, seven by 14. But that's your typical uh, terminology: number of holes, then size of holes in thousands of an inch. That's a five by 14. The stock injector in this engine had a five by nine injector, so that's five holes, nine thousands. This is five by 14, so quite a big jump. We just, we probably could have gone smaller because we knew this was a tow truck. We just didn't have it in us. So the dowel pin's right here. And it vibrates loose and falls down into the gear. The gear spins this way. It usually gets wedged here and breaks the case and causes an oil leak. There's a bolt we've removed right here. Mike's making a tab that we're going to put under this bolt. And we're going to Loctite this. And that tab goes over the top of this dowel pin so that it can't come loose. This is our cardboard template. It's nothing fancy. Cut it on the vertical bandsaw, sand it, test fit it, and if it needs adjustment, I'll sand it a little more. So I put the dampener back on. We're rigging up a wire here with a bolt so that we can make a pointer. And we're gonna put this degree wheel on here. Uh, which has assembly lube on it now. It was beautiful. Um, I think, uh, and uh, we're gonna add four degrees of timing to this. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we've got our heat treated titanium TIG rod from Mike Finnegan here. That's why it's this beautiful copper color. And we're using this as a pointer. So we threw the dampener back on, just threw a couple bolts in so it's tight and doesn't move, threw the degree wheel on. We know the engine's at TDC, so we're going to turn this so it's at TDC right now. Then we are going to back the engine up. Do it for you? Yeah, go ahead and do it for me. So we're about six degrees. Okay, go the other way. We're going to take all the gear lash and end up right at... I'm going to go right at uh, five because I want to set my truck to 19 because I like to... I like to party. Keep going. A little more, a little more. We've got another degree and a half. Right there. Perfect. Now we've added five degrees. Now we're going to slap this gear back on after we clean it, which we did. Now the pump shaft will now turn in sync with the engine. I love the magnetic degree wheel. That is awesome. We're going to put the rockers back in. So these are the ARP 625 head studs. The ARP makes two different grades of head studs for this engine. This is a higher one. There's a ARP 2000s, which are really a very high quality step. What we're, what we're trying to do here, uh, without having O-rings or fire rings, we're going to try to really clamp this head down so it'll survive the compound turbos. That's why we're using the, the higher uh, 625 head studs. Whenever you do head studs on a 12 valve, you got to machine a little pocket. You notice the the step down here, stock ones come flat all the way across. The reason we do this is because the, this stud protrudes up a lot higher and the nut is a lot bigger up here than the head bolt and it interferes with the valve cover and will make it seal a leak oil like crazy. So you got to machine this out, that way your valve cover can seal. That's the purpose of that machining. Wow, this, looks like, this looks like it's been leaking. Look yeah, this. look at this. 
Yeah, look at the whole city. Yeah, look at that. See how crowded that is? You mean? We should get a head gasket. Let's do it. Plot thickens. It is Tuesday night, and we've installed our ARP studs. We're torquing the last couple of them, and when we pulled out the head bolts we were replacing, we saw water on the threads. Looked down in the cylinder head and found even more coolant, so now we're really starting to study the block and do some forensics, and it really looks like the head gasket had been leaking on this thing, so we're going to take the head off, find a gasket in the morning. Probably won't be swinging this in tonight. And uh, we'll probably do that tomorrow, and I don't know, it might be another late night. We'll see what my wife thinks. Oh my god, this is heavy. Walk over here and set up. Stupid cast iron cylinder head. <laughs> Can we turn it over? Yep. I like to see the chambers. Yep. yep, there's no chambers. Wow. So we're about to do some work on the surface of the block here. And uh, these oil holes, these go right down to your main oil galley. If anything falls down here, that can work its way into your piston cooler. If you plug a an oil jet that cools your pistons, they tend to swell and stick to your piston walls. It's a bad thing. So the simple thing here, get some earplugs, stick them down there, cut them off flat, and then you can do whatever you like on the surface without fear of putting stuff into your oil galley. Here's our morning update. You'll notice, cylinder head is now off. Yes, we are indeed going backwards. We discovered it was leaking, we decided to pull it off, look everything over, and it confirmed it needed a head gasket, and we think it's actually been replaced once already. And since we had the head off, then we decided to o-ring the block, you know, for more power. And then we realized we didn't have the, the ring to o-ring the block, so we had to go find that. And it's all kind of snowballed into engines still not in truck, but we're going to modify it for the better so that later on, if I lose my mind and turn the wick up on this thing, we won't be replacing the head gasket again, in theory. Yeah. Hopefully. It yeah. should be fine there, that's for sure. Yeah, so um, deck surface has been cleaned. We're about ready to start cutting the grooves in. Before we do that, what are you going to do? We are working on the delivery valves really quick. Okay. So basically, a fuel restriction in the pump that makes the fuel event end quickly and we're just putting some bigger delivery valves in. Made this special splined socket to go on here, break them loose, drop the delivery valves in, put this back down and, and we're all done. The only little thing to catch is uh, some models of pump, there's a little washer, crush washer under there, we don't want to reuse that, get rid of it. If you have a newer model pump like this, there is no little crush washer. So if it has the crush washers, you're replacing them or just throwing them away? We're just throwing them away. Another mod we're doing here is uh, the governor springs. This will just let the engine rev higher before it defuels. So we're replacing the, the factory governor springs, which uh, govern out about 22, 2300. They start cutting fuel. They'll free rev to about 3000. With these governor springs, they'll free rev to about 4500. They don't really start cutting fuel to about 3800 RPM. This is the AFC housing. We're gonna take this off so we can remove the fuel plate and I'll let the AFC Live do all of our control of the fueling. Pretty simple here. Fuel plate just got these two screws. This is how you pick up a lot of power. Between this and the AFC Live's max travel kit, this is over half of the power gain we're getting just right here. It's basically a fuel stop. Pull it out, let the AFC Live do the control of the fuel with the other foot that's in here. So we're taking apart the AFC so we can do the, the max travel modifications that come with the AFC Live Kit so that we can get more fuel delivery out of the pump. This is gonna unlock another 25 to 50 horsepower on this truck. This is the foot out of the AFC housing. We're gonna cut the barrel or the back side down. We're gonna take about an eighth of an inch off of here so this can travel further, unlock some more horsepower. Okay, we just finished grinding the foot to pick up some travel. Now we're going to put the uh, max travel kit in here. You can see the factory spring versus the one we're putting in. This one's a little heavier, so it's better for compounds, and it can travel because it's longer. It won't coil bind, which lets us have fuel control all the way up to higher boost ranges and uh, gives us power and uh, smoke control at the same time.
AFC housing is all modified, it's got the max travel kit in it. We're just going to put it back on the pump now. This is a good way to do uh, O-ring in your, in your garage. Most people, a lot of people O-ring their head, which kind of requires some jigs and especially machinery. This is a cheap tool called the Iski Groovomatic that we can set and we can actually cut the O-ring the block and we're going to cut that right now. Why are we cutting an O-ring in the block? We're cutting an O-ring in the block because we want to increase our power capacity. This will actually, the O-ring is going to protrude up about 10 thousandths, 11 thousandths above the deck height. It's going to bite into the firing of the stock head gasket. It gives us a lot more uh, protection from the fire escaping out of uh, the cylinder walls. At what point should you be doing this? Is it a boost level? Is it a cylinder pressure level? It's cylinder pressure, a... like if you have a single turbo, you could go up probably 750 horsepower pretty easy without this. You do compound turbos, you're going to make 750 horsepower at a much lower RPM, so your cylinder pressure is much higher. Okay. I like this uh, with any compound turbos, you're going to actually ag feel aggressively. Mm -hmm. um, but a single turbo, you could probably go up oh, 750 horsepower, you probably want to do something with a single turbo or above. So 750 on a single, do the head studs, change the head gasket, you're probably fine. Yeah. Get after it beyond that and you should O-ring the block. O-ring it. Yeah, or firing, which is another, is a higher end thing. That's what like the race motors do. They actually cut the firing out of the gasket <coughs> completely mm -hmm. and put a piece of steel wire and they machine a receiver groove either in the block, in the head, or both. And it's a radius receiver groove that perfectly fits that wire. Okay. And uh, it's a lot thicker. It's like a... It's 100 thousandths, maybe? 105 thousandths. 105 thousandths diameter wire, so it's, it's quite large. Got it. It's starting to be down on parts. <laughs> so just in case any of these stud holes are cracked, we're going to seal the bottom of the studs to make sure coolant doesn't leak out of them. They're blind, but we saw coolant in some of the holes and it was either from the head gasket leaking around a water passage or because the block was cracked in the holes. And let's not find out the hard way. This looks racy now. <laughs> Lots of bling here. Shiny ARP head studs. Big end, right? Plus, it's starting to feel like we're not we're no longer going backwards. Yes, we kind of bend the bottom of the hole, which is nice. We hit the pit, now we're on our way back out. <laughs> we hit the bottom. On the bright side, if it was going to leak before, it should be good now. Less a chance of that happening now. So we replaced most of the gaskets. In the oh, I'm paranoid that when you flip it over, something's going to leak. Land on a head gasket. And it doesn't seal. Doesn't seal. Yeah. Just pause, not over the engine, somewhere like there, back here. Okay, go that way. Your side seems to get in. There we go. There we go. Oh, you got some movement. Hold on. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> We're in the real training here. We gotta make this legit. Good job. Head torqued on. Looks good. We're almost back to zero. Yay! <laughs> We're almost back to square one. This is the good part. It's gonna be fun. Yeah. <laughs> We're back to square one. The engine is together, and now. It's time to release the twins. <laughs> Tell me all about them. All right, this is our first initial stage of mock-up for the turbos. This, this is a small turbo of the compound turbo system. This is a 57 millimeter uh, Borg Warner unit. Actually, it's, a, it's called a K27. And uh, this is a really good turbo for the RPM range Mike expressed he wanted to be in, which is a towing RPM range. going to be between you know, 1800 and 2500. This thing's going to be real cherry. Much above that, it'll still work but there's better turbos for above 2,500 RPM. But uh, for towing, this guy's the one you want. All right. And then we're gonna pair this with another turbo in a minute. But okay. first we're gonna put this one on the manifold so we can start making our oil lines. All right, and we don't need a gasket, we're just mocking this. Yeah, we're just mocking so. it up. We just get it in place, so. we can make our oil supply and drain lines. So remember, keyboard warriors, we're not putting a gasket in because it's coming back off, okay? <laughs> You can also pretend it's like two engines here, okay? So this one feeds this 
inlet. Okay. This one feeds this inlet. Okay. This exhaust feeds this exhaust. This exhaust feeds this exhaust. And you just got you're just working your way in a circle here. Okay. Makes sense. So air to air to air, exhaust to exhaust to exhaust. Okay. So this is our air inlet from the outs from the atmosphere. And exhaust the atmosphere. And exhaust the atmosphere. And then this is feeding the inlet of this. This is going into the engine. Yep. Okay. Got it. Cool. So riddle me this. Uh, what determines the max power of the system? This turbo or this turbo? Are you limited by what's coming in from the atmosphere? Are you limited by? Hmm. Like draw the flow paths, and I don't know what is the answer. I have no I because I literally need to sit here and draw arrows and figure out this is coming from here, this is coming here. But my guess is that that's the choke point from the atmosphere. Absolutely correct. Okay. All right. We are dangerously close from being able to swing that over here and finding out once and for all. Does it fit better in a square body Chevy than it does in that beautiful second gen Dodge Ram? I think it does. <laughs> it does. <laughs> and not just because it's a better looking truck. No, no. Um, so anyway, it won't just fall in there. We need to make motor mounts, transmission mount. We may have to do some notching of the firewall here. We'll find out in a second. We're going to speed up that process by using conversion motor mounts from diesel conversion specialists. And these guys are out of Kalispell, Montana. The way this works is you have a factory style pillow block here that'll bolt to the chassis, replace those worn out rubber ones with some stronger urethane. At least I think that's what that is. It's like polyurethane. Polyurethane. Sounds good. All right. And then these are, Jesus, half, half inch, inch thick, half inch thick steel plate adapters that should bolt to the block unless our new compound turbo kit is in the way. We're going to find that out right now. Very few things in the aftermarket just go on without a little massaging. This is impressive. This is a good sign right here. Chinese engine hoist being reassembled because this is ready to go in there. We're going to hook it to the hoist, spin it around, bolt the trans to it, and then make our first attempt at stabbing the inline sixth into what used to house the V8. The motor is so cool looking now. So we're about to bolt on this 650 horsepower transmission to Mike's engine here. A real important piece of the puzzle is the torque converter. In a diesel truck, if you get the converter too tight of a stall, it makes the turbos really laggy. If you get it too loose, it makes it feel like you're slipping your clutch. It's terrible. So this one here, this is a triple disc uh, torque converter from Diesel Performance Converters. We use them a lot. Uh, it works really well and this is paired very good for this turbo system. So it's going to give them really good spool up really good uh, power coping away from stoplights when he's towing his loads. Uh, we're using the Power Torque ATF. This is kind of designed for diesels. Uh, for it increases the torque capacity, a little bit, a little bit more friction, so uh, the clutches don't slip quite as much. So we really like this combination here. Uh, it works really well for us. We've never asked this hoist to do this much. Hold on, hold on. You're right here. We gotta come forward. Come forward and get off of that. Whatever that is. Oh, the top of the tr tranny bell housing adapter is touching the firewall. Okay. All right. Well, here's where we're at. We've got the motor and the trans in the chassis, just kind of dangling there. We've got the engine sitting at three degrees down. The rear pinion angle is four degrees up on this truck right now. And our exhaust manifold touches the firewall. Our balancer is almost touching that front cross member. The motor mounts are not bolted together because the engine needs to go back about an inch in order for them to line up. So I think what we're going to do is pull this out in the morning, cut the firewall, cut the cross member, bolt the biscuits back onto the engine block, and then shove the thing in there and set it down, reset everything. That will enable us to measure our drive shafts go out and get those made and then lock this thing down and then it's on to plumbing and wiring and everything else and figuring out how we're going to fit a radiator and intercooler and the fan and everything else in here. So I think we're done for tonight. What day is it? 
I think it's Thursday. We've been at this for a solid three days. Engine is prepped, it is in the truck, and right now it's just kind of resting on the cross member. And the trans is resting on a floor jack. And it's sitting at a four degree down angle, which is matching the four degree up angle that uh, the pinion of the rear axle is sitting at. It's kind of a lot. I'd like to see it closer to two. But what we're running into right now is our diesel conversion specialist mounts are not sitting completely on the factory frame mount that goes from the cross member to the frame rail. And the reason for that is the engine is actually touching the firewall. Both the cylinder head and the back corner of our exhaust manifold are hitting the firewall. So question time, you know, what do we do? Do we cut the firewall, tub it, so we can move the motor back to make that line up, which gives us a whole lot of room between the radiator and the mechanical fan that was on this, or do we slide the frame mounts forward, brace everything, mount it about an inch forward from where it is, <clears throat> and leave the firewall alone, which also means we can leave our HVAC alone, which is right behind the firewall. Uh, it's less work to do that, but then we don't know whether we can fit the mechanical fan back in there or if I'm going to have to switch to aftermarket electric fans. Uh, we don't know whether that's going to screw up fitting the intercooler in here, you know, all the AC parts. We don't know any of that. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to grab our core support, put it where it's supposed to be, get our angle of our motor kind of where we want it, and then we're going to see if we can fit the fan back in there and then make our decision. Definitely not getting the mechanical fan in there and the radiator. All right. Wow. I guess we're tubbing the firewall. That sucks. <laughs> Pull the HVCA out, HV, HVAC out from the inside. Cut the firewall, put the motor back in where it's supposed to go, and then see if that's enough room to slide the Cummins radiator in there. And if it is, we'll modify this for the Cummins intercooler, the Cummins radiator, and we'll just make it work. All our bolts are hidden behind the inner fender. This is what the lazy man does when he wants that out of there because it's never going in again. And it was cracked off. There you go. Got it. We need break the squirrel cage. Engine and trans back out for I think the third time and I've marked off an area of the firewall where the exhaust manifold and the rocker cover were hitting. We're going to cut that out using the death wheel. The reason I call this the death wheel is because these tend to explode and when they do, if you're not wearing a whole lot of personal protection, you can take one of those things to the face and you know, you've got an artery here, here. I don't know, I'm not a doctor, but it would be bad, so. We are ready. Go. Cool. Uh, it's gotta come back about two inches which means the entire cylinder head is going to go right through the firewall. So I need to cut it all the way down and back, probably an inch. Okay. Wow! Trans is into the floor. Who's ready for an update? After a whole lot of cutting, the 12 valve and the 47 RH are in here. We had to relieve the floor. We had to relieve the firewall. The cylinder head is about six inches from the gas pedal. And this is because we set up the motor mounts on the Cummins directly over the old motor mounts for the Chevy. And what that did was 
hopefully give us enough room to run the stock mechanical fan and the Cummins radiator in here. Um, we haven't really test fit that yet, but we're pretty sure that's how that's going to work out. We could have shoved it further forward and customized our mounts, but the gap between the radiator and the motor would have been really small, would have been hard to service the truck, and we would have had to run probably a single electric fan, which I'm not a fond I'm not fond of in an application where you're going to be towing up a mountain, you know, 10, 11, 12,000 pounds. So we shoved it back, cut everything apart. We'll do a lot of patchwork in here, but I think in the end, this is a better way to go for me. Oh, we're hitting this little thing. Dude, yeah, this is going to work. Because yeah. even if we have to notch into this, mm -hmm. we'll be able to get that in there. Maybe we'll be able to use the shroud. The shroud would be really cool. Yeah. So it really helps efficiency, obviously. Whew. Good day. We got a lot done. We cut out a whole lot of the firewall trans tunnel and floor in order to fit this thing in there and move it back far enough to fit the stock Dodge Ram radiator, mechanical fan, fan shroud. This is all going to work and we hacked the opening in the core support big enough where we're pretty much exposing I'd say 90% of the radiator to the air which is great and we think we're going to be able to stuff the original intercooler back in here. I don't think the stock grill will fit, uh, but maybe that crappy tube one that I took out and tried to give away on the show last year and nobody claimed it, that might have to go back in here. Uh, but yeah, I mean, dude, really good day. And tomorrow we'll just keep plugging away at it. And I think by the end of the day tomorrow we'll have some plumbing in there and it'll look like it wants to run. It won't run, but it'll, it'll look like it wants to. We're on the bottom side of the truck now because we have the engine mounted and it's time to mount the trans. And this truck has a three-piece drive shaft. And so after setting the trans angle to match the very first U-joint, I realized the cross member is going to be really easy to make because this is the factory Dodge isolator and trans mount and it's right in line with the bottom of the frame. So this is going to be simple. This truck's not lowered, so I'll be able to take a cross member and bolt it right to the bottom of the frame and it will be in there in like 20 minutes so first piece of the puzzle it's actually going smoothly it's kind of nice it is morning time actually it's probably closer to lunch and right now I'm building the transmission cross member I'm gonna this is a one by two inch rectangular steel tubing I'm gonna drill holes for the transmission isolator there one hole at each end for it to bolt to the chassis. I'm gonna weld bungs into this so that as we tighten it, it doesn't smash this. Otherwise, when you just bear down on the on the nut and it clamps here, it might cave in the tubing. So I'm gonna weld bungs in here to prevent that. And then there'll be a gusset that goes from here up to the top side of the frame rail. Uh, so that all that force from the torque doesn't try to twist the frame rails or bend them or anything like that. bolt this on and then I'll run a transfer point through it, mark the frame, and then we'll drill the frame real quick. It's perfect on my side. Yeah, perfect on my side. Cool. Must be the way it goes. Must have a left and a right. Ooh. What? I like that. You're right. The Cummins does fit better in a Chevy after you cut the firewall. <laughs> and the trans tunnel. After you employ the death wheel, the 12 valve Cummins belongs in the square body shed. Yeah. And I promise you, this engine will outlast the body of this truck. <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> it must really start. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Alright, so you basically want it Just, I was just looking at that going, holy oh, crap, man. Are you kidding me? And then I make a cab off the other side of the other headlight. Yeah. That's really hilarious. <laughs> Dude. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Stock girl fits in here. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> no, really Forget about it. it. Holy cow. <laughs> Once again, the 12 valve Cummins is made for the square body. <laughs> As long as you want maximum ventilation in your firewall, you know. Yeah, small. Who doesn't want that? Wow. This is amazing. I was sitting here going this morning. I wrote on there hood latch. Like, what am I going to do about that? <laughs> I'm just going to put the stock one back in. Boom. Wow. Look at that. And this is all the support I need to put this back up and make it perfect. Mm -hmm. Definitely good call to move it back. Yeah, look at all the things that work perfect now because we shoved the motor backwards. And look at this. There's a cover plate that goes on top of the stock Chevy radiator. Bolts here. All of these bolts line up. And I know this is for a wiring harness, but it's like it was meant to be. <laughs> Celebration beer. Generally bottle opener. You need one of these. Look at that! It's in there! <laughs> That's pretty so sweet. It's Friday morning. This is the end of the first part of this build. These guys gotta get on an airplane and go home. I gotta be a dad again and a husband because I've been uh, lacking in those areas this week. A lot of late nights. But we are close. That engine, that trans, those are locked in place. We have the stock radiator shroud, overflow bottle, intercooler, it's all in there and all of the plumbing fits, even the upper and lower radiator hoses. Um, you know, if I ever break down, I can go to a parts store, tell them I have a 97 Dodge Ram, and I can get those service items, which is awesome. So now all we really gotta do is make the transmission shift, the fuel system work, some wiring, and the big things is the plumbing. So we're gonna cut up some mandrel bends right here to connect the intercooler to the turbo and the intercooler to the intake. And then uh, that'll be it here. I suppose we should get our pipe, or we can get our death either way. Maybe two cuts. There you go. That's pretty good. Although well, you're going to want to cut this back. Yeah, to I think that. Exactly. I see we're too far over. We need to come in this direction. Right, so let me get it. So, to put this turbo kit in the square body Chevy, we had to take a different approach than in the second gen Dodge that this kit was originally designed for. We had to remove the heat exchanger, but he's going to do aftermarket training coolers anyway, so that wasn't a problem. Tack back together. So then all we need is our 90 there. So in order to make this work, we had to trim the fender well in order to get a straight shot into the intercooler. Yeah, we can cut it long, mm -hmm. bend it up, and then just keep cutting it until that relaxes. Yep. Now it just wants to fall together. Mm -hmm. Once we had the boots in position, we simply connected the outlet of the turbo to the end of the intercooler, keeping our angle straight. It's very important that the pipe is built such there's not a lot of uh, force on the cooler, on the intercooler boots. We wanted it just to lay in there nice and natural, and you clamp it up and things work really well. Turbo plumbing's done. Mm-hmm. Minus finish, finish welding. Yeah. So all we gotta do is finish weld that, bead roll both ends, put the hose clamps on, build the exhaust, plate the firewall, a little bit of wiring, fuel system, and we're rolling! And you'll see that on another episode of Finnegan's Garage. You guys gonna come back for that? I think so. Burnouts? Burnouts, big burnouts. Yeah, we owe you guys burnouts. We'll have those. Cool! And if you wanna see more videos between now and when part two of this comes out, head on over to Power Driven Diesel's YouTube page. They have all kinds of cool race stuff there. You're gonna dig it. Thanks.